good evening, or good morning. <laughs> Thank you for being here today uh, for the morning worship service here at Southside Baptist Church. We're certainly glad to, to see you. Uh, I do want to share a, a few things with you that uh, we need to that we've had to change uh, this week. Uh, Bible school, now remember this, will now roll from Tuesday to Friday. We had to do that. We'd had some folks, been around some folks, and had to have, get time to get clear and stuff. And so I think we've got everything back in order. We just need to take care of ourselves, and we will. Uh, everything is sprayed and clean and taken care of. But it will actually begin for the kids and all on Tuesday night. And uh, it would, this is the way it begins, so you need to listen. There will be supper each night. Now, I will teach the adult class. And that will be in here on the greatest chapter in the Bible. And uh, that will be the study for the week. And uh, so if you've come into the adult Bible study, then you can wait to about quarter to six to come eat, let the kids eat, and, and then they'll be in here at six o'clock. And then uh, before 6.30, they'll be gone, and you can be eating during that time. And uh, uh, then the adults will come in here and... We'll, we'll take over uh, and do our Bible study uh, that week on the greatest chapter, maybe the greatest verse out of the greatest book in the Bible. Now, adults will be a little bit different on this respect. I will actually begin this morning. See, he's taking a day away because we had to take a day out. So I ain't going to have time to get through it all anyway. So I'll start this morning. And I'll be in Bible school mode preaching tonight. And so we'll get our missed day in there. Anyway, so just want to make you aware of that for the, those that are coming here for the adult Bible study on the book of Romans. All right. Any other announcements that we need to make before we begin our worship uh, this morning? All right. Just remember, supper for anybody who wants to eat. Don't cost you anything. Five o'clock next week, starting Tuesday. Miss Lisa's going to come and lead us in our, our hymn, This is a Day that the Lord has Made. I'm going to ask you to stand as we sing with uh, each other on this, and then I will uh, get the kids to come forward. Okay. So much. Maybe seated children. Uh, all our kids this morning, if we've got any, y'all come up here. I need to finish a story that I started with you a couple weeks ago. Y'all will come. There we go. <laughs> hey, baby. How you doing? All right. How y'all doing this morning? You doing good? You doing good? All right. Coming to Bible school? Yeah, we'll come to Bible school. Okay? All right. I want to start, I, I told you the other week about Jesus one day was, had come ashore and people were following around him and he had taught them and he taught them and he taught them a long time and they sat up there on the mountains and on the sides and they got hungry. And Jesus had told his disciples what? We need to feed these people. So they began looking. They said, we don't have any money to buy food for thousands of people. We don't have the meat. How are we going to feed them? And one of the disciples came across a little boy. And in that, his basket, he had two loaves of bread or five loaves and two fish. That's all he had. They carried that to Jesus. Jesus looked at it, and he says, 
this will feed them. Now, how much, how far can you go with just a few fish and a few pieces of bread when you got more people than you know what to do with? Not very far, can you? So this is what he tells his disciples. They bring baskets to him. He starts reaching in that basket with the bread and the fish in it, and he begins to fill up their basket. And they would go and march out among the people with their baskets, and they would get the food out of it. He would go, they would go back to Jesus again. He would fill their baskets up again until what happened to all the people that were hungry? They got fed. All of them, from one little boy's little basket. And he fed everybody. But that's not all. Do you know what happened? After everybody's fed and everybody's filled up, Jesus asked his disciples, what are we going to do with the leftovers? Leftovers? After feeding maybe 10, 15,000 people, we got leftovers? And they did. And they filled their baskets up, and they carried their baskets with them. And there was always more food than they knew what to do with. So I just want to say this, too. Jesus can do anything. Jesus works miracles. Jesus can change. He can take a few fish and a few pieces of bread and feed everybody. He can calm the sea. He can make it rain. He can stop it. Jesus is a miracle-working God. And Jesus can do anything you ask him to do if he wants to. The question was asked one time, is there anything too hard for him? And the answer is what? No. Nothing's too hard for him. He loves us. He takes care of us. And you could be one day that little boy or that little girl that grows up with something you've got and helps somebody else with it along the way and be a friend. Okay? All right? Father, thank you, God, for this little boy that God at that point in time in his life, he was this young fella, and he probably never knew, God, what impact he would make on these people's lives. Lord, I don't know if he ever got the credit for what he did. Probably most of those people there that were ate out of his basket never knew where, where the food came from. But God, I'm thankful that you are God, that you can do anything. You can turn fishes and bread into food, into a lot of food, that, God, you can do for us whatever you want to do. I pray, dear God, as they grow up, that, God, they might be that little boy or that little girl that shares with others. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Here we go. He said he'd go dig down to the bottom of the well. He ain't go back there. Okay. <laughs> yes, okay. All right. You got them. You got them. Go ten. She's going to take care of y'all this morning.
this time we're going to have prayer, and uh, uh, then uh, Lisa will come and lead us in our congregation. Him, my ushers <coughs> will come and take up the offering. Would you pray with us, please? Our Father God, I thank you, Lord, that we're able to get up and come this morning. God, I pray that, Lord, as we worship in this place, that God, as always, that we would feel your presence through the Holy Spirit of God. Father, much that we will preach and be talking about this week is how it is and what are the benefits and what have we gained by being a child of the King. God, sometimes it's kind of like I said with the children, all those thousands of people that sit up on that hillside, most of them probably never realized that it was a little boy that fed them, that Jesus Christ took what he had. And sometimes, God, we'll never understand why you bless us like you do. God, but we do know this, that every good blessing we ever got comes from the Father above that God, obedience brings the blessings of God. Lord, we're obedient. We're in your house today. God, as we sing, as we preach, as we study your word together, my prayer is, God, it would be meaningful to us. God, I pray that it would reach down in our hearts and touch us. Let us understand, God, what a great salvation we have that sometimes we take for granted. But God, let us understand the reality of it. Lord, I pray that you'll be with us tonight as we in the adults will continue to, to preach and to teach from where we leave off this morning on Romans as we go through Bible school. God, I pray for the children. I pray for all the planning that's been done. I realize that, that God, that old Satan has set us back a little bit, but God, we're still moving forward. And God, I pray that you'll protect us. God, I pray you'll take care of us. And God, I pray that there'll be a blessing to everybody that comes this week. For it's in Jesus' name that we do humbly pray. Amen. Offer to him, blessed be the name. Miss Lisa and our ushers will come forward. Seated, we uh, again thank you for coming today and, and being with us. Uh, again, our special music today, Miss Lisa is going to come and uh, to share with us our special song, and then we'll begin our journey for the next week through the book of Romans. So, 
Uh, Miss Lisa, you come sing for us. Aren't you glad that God makes the dirty clean? Which is what she said in that song. That God takes the dirty, which was me and you, at one point in our life, 
and he made us clean. And he's the only one that can do that. So uh, thank you, Lisa, for singing that. If you have your Bibles, I want you, we're going to start. This is actually a, a quick start of Bible school and how to be in, uh, in, the week, in the days ahead. But if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Romans, the 8th chapter. Now, when I always struggle with what is the right thing to do at Bible school that will keep people wanting to come each night and uh, stay faithful each night, and I'll be honest with you, it's not easy for me to do much anymore. And so earlier this year, we, uh, I got this book on the 8th chapter of Romans. And I began, I didn't know where I would use it at, but then about May, God put me on this, and we've been studying ever since. And what I've learned about the book of Romans is this. For you that are um, of the athletic uh, mind, when you mention the term goat, what that literally means is the greatest of all times. And when you think of football, some of you would think Tom Brady. You could name your own goat. Everybody's got who they think is the greatest. But in reading and studying from many, many things, the one thing I've learned about the eighth chapter of the book of Romans, that number one, the book of Romans, by most pastors and theologians, is considered the greatest of all time. They believe it's the greatest chapter in the book, they believe it holds the greatest verse in the book. And it is in the greatest book that was ever written. Those three things are the greatest of all time according to most theologians that read and write and study the Bible. What happens with Romans? It gets very deep in what it means to be a Christian today. What it means, what is how, what the, the, the length of time that you have been saved up to the point that you and I live now. The blessings that God has blessed us with are more than we can ever sit here today and even imagine. We could, that song that says that we can never count all our blessings, if we named them one by one, we would still be amazed at what God has done. Most of us will die and leave this world never understanding all the blessings that we've received. That we are alive today because he let us be. That we're in this house today because you chose to be. And God is here because he wants to be where his people worship in spirit and in truth. The chap eighth chapter of the book of Romans is about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, what God does in our lives through the Holy Spirit, and we can only become what God wants us to be on this earth only through the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. Don't we'll never accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. So if you have your Bible, I want you to open it. Chapter 8 of Romans, the great book, the great chapter. And we'll begin our journey, and this is to tell us what the spiritual life and being a child of God means to us. If you found Romans, just stand with me a minute. Let's, we won't get this today. We'll get part of it. We'll get some of it tonight. But let's look at these first four verses. I'll probably do one word in this verse this morning, or maybe two. Paul says that there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the flesh, not after the flesh, but are walking after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life is in Christ Jesus, has made me free from the law and sin. Paul here is given a personal how he had a relationship with the Lord. He said it was because of my relationship with God 
that I am free from the law of sin. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. God, those are four very powerful verses of Scripture there. God, sometimes, and what I want us to learn this week and starting today, that God, we don't have the joy and the happiness and the peace in our lives because we need a better relationship with you, and that's where these things come from. When our focus begins to be on the spiritual thing, not on the, the earthly things. When our whole life abounds about Jesus and about heaven and all the blessings of God, that we don't let this world discourage us and depress us today. God, we need that kind of spiritual growth. We need that kind of spiritual There's not a child of God that I know of today that doesn't need that in their life. This old world is tough, but God, you're greater than this world. So, God, as we start this journey this morning, God, I pray as we go through it this week, that, God, you'd bless it, that, God, mainly you'd speak to our hearts, and that, God, I pray that when Friday evening comes, that, God, we will have drawn closer to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dr. Stephen Cole wrote this. He says, I've come and I've read Romans 8 again and again. He said, when I've been discouraged, ever been there? When I've been depressed, he said, I don't see how you can read Romans 8 and remain in that struggle. He said, if you struggle with sin, if you're going through trial, read Romans 8. If you don't know how to pray, read it. If you need assurance, this is the key, of your salvation, he said, read Romans 8 is what he said. So you can see, this is what this chapter does. I see a lot of Christians that do not have a smile on their face. I see a lot of Christians that are burdened down because of many things that could call these situations to come in their life. The Bible said, God said that he wanted us what? To have life and to have it more abundantly, doesn't he? He says, I have come to you that you might have joy, and yet I see a world full of sadness today. Even in the church, sadness. When the people of God ought to be the most joyful people that they are in the world today. And so what chapter 8 does are two things. And this is going to be the goal this week. It will teach us how to effectively live the Christian life. How can I live my life as a Christian at the utmost best? How can I peek it out, not just being a so-so a, a Christian, but that I can make my life for Jesus effectively? And secondly, it will teach us, and this is what we need to learn, what God intends to for my life to be. What does God intend for Jimmy to be? What does God intend for you to be? We'll find all of the answers to these things in this study that we're going through. Now, the Bible says that if we're a Christian, that freedom is a part of our life. And we've heard that statement that says, if the Son makes you free, that you're free indeed, right? But very few Christians, include, even because I'm nothing special, but until I studied studying the words and studying this book, I never realized how much freedom I had in Christ Jesus. I never saw it, never thought about it anywhere else. But, what you'll do this week is learn about who you are 
who you are in Jesus and the freedoms that God has given us as his children. Now, when we think about this, when you think about what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean if you can say in your heart, I've been saved, I know Jesus. What does that really mean? Does it really mean what it ought to mean to us? And that's the key to it. Because for me, uh, it doesn't all the time do that. You see, as children of God, what we forget sometimes is that all the blessings we have in life have come from Him. The Bible says our blessings as Christian. I'm talking to Christian people now. They come from God. Now, you make no bones about it. The devil can bless people too. He does. That's how he fools them into following and, and living for him and doing the things he wants to do. He's no idiot. Remember when he had Jesus in that garden after Jesus was baptized. What did he try to do? He tried to follow Jesus or to get Jesus to follow him by offering him the world, by offering him all the power, all the riches. But Jesus knew that the greatest freedom that you and I ever have in our life, and we miss it most of the time through our walk, is our freedom that comes because we're a Christian. So this is the deal. Preacher, what am I free from? I'm born again. I've been saved. I've asked the Lord to come into my heart. You, uh, the, the Son has given me freedom. What? Explain to me, preacher, about this freedom that I have. And this will begin our journey in this book. Now, I want to share with you, there are several things that will be made clear this week from Romans 8. That sin is the most destructive force that the world has ever seen. That the reason that the world is in the condition it is in is because of sin. We, we don't think sometimes, but sin is the deadliest force that there is on the face of the earth. But we don't think about, we don't want to think about that. King David said in Psalms 51, 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, sin. And in sin, my mother conceived me. So what the Bible tells us about sin is this. That every one of us that is in this building today were conceived sinners when we were born. From the day we began to the day that we live in now, we were born sinners. We... This is what I use and tell people all the time. You've heard me say it plenty of time. One thing, when I was growing up, my mother never had me to teach me to do something wrong. My daddy never had to teach me to do something wrong. I always had that built into me to learn how to do something wrong. It didn't take a teaching lesson to do that. That was born in me. The Bible calls that the natural spirit. We were all born the same way. Natural spirit. And yet in the third chapter of John, and this is just Jimmy, I would argue with everything I said and say to me, the greatest chapter might be the third chapter of John, but I'm not talking about me now. I'm talking about what people smarter than me think. We were born with, that, with sin in us. And you see, the, well, preacher, how can you make a statement like that? Because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that all have sinned and come glory of the short, short of the glory of God. There's nobody in here. I mean, we can't point at anybody else about what they've done or what we think they've done, or they can't point at us because you know what? We're just as guilty as any of them are. I'm just as guilty as anybody else is of doing things wrong, making bad choices, doing things in my life that I ought not to do. Sin is universal. From the time we breathed our breath to right now. But the greatest 
thing about this book and this chapter is. There is a word in this book that we will talk about many times in this week ahead. And that is the word condemnation. Paul says, even though you were born in it, even though you live in it, even though you may still do it or plan on doing it, when God sees it, God says that there is therefore now no condemnation. God will forgive sin. We must all rejoice if we don't rejoice in anything but that. Now, so against that backdrop that I've just given to you, let's look a little bit at verse 1. Why is freedom so important? As Americans, we, we remember July the 4th, we remember those, because we say that was the day that freedom came. But I want to tell you, as a man or a woman or a boy or a girl, the greatest freedom you received was never on July the 4th. It was on the day that you came to know Jesus. It says that he set you free from what sin was going to cost you if you had lived on in that result. So the reason for your free, freedom, number one, in that very first verse of Scripture in Romans there, I want you to notice the word, therefore. There is therefore. Now, therefore, when you read it in the Bible, means this. What have I previously talked about? What have I previously been preaching about? What have I been talking to you about? Therefore, he comes to number eight because of what he said in, in chapters one through seven. He says a lot of things every, uh, in these chapters in Romans. Every chapter has some great scripture in it. And he goes through all these seven, and then he comes to the great chapter eight. And he says, therefore, because of what came before, chapter one through seven. That's why I've got to write this chapter. Now in chapter one, I'm going to just share with you in this teaching this morning. Chapter 1, verse 20 says this. Now, Paul says, therefore, because chapter 1, verse 20 says this, it is necessary. What does it say? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are of no excuse. The thing he says is this that God has put enough in the world, that God has put enough preachers, he's put enough sights, he's the creation by God, that anybody ought to understand this, that this world was created by a holy God. It was not created by the Big Bang Theory. It was not created because scientists figured something out millions of years ago. That's bunk. This world was created by God. And what did he say? That the problem with man in chapter 1 was what? That they worshipped the creation more than they did the creator. That's a problem. That's a problem in the world today. I mentioned this Wednesday night, so I don't want to stay here. But folks, one of the biggest problems we've got has to deal exactly what he says in chapter 1, because we live in a world today where we worship this creation. We worship the birds, the sea, the water, the mountains, the clean air, the, uh, all of this stuff. All of this is a worship of what God created instead of the God who created it all. He said that's the way it would be. So that's what he says in chapter 1. That is very important leading up to chapter 8. And then you flip over to chapter 2, and you'll find Paul saying this. This is another therefore. Verse 9, he says, Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, the Jew first, the Gentile. Let's look at verse 11. This is the key. He says that God is no respecter of man. God is not a respecter. 
God doesn't like white over black, blue over yellow, green over purple. God looks at a man's heart. God sees what a man's heart is like. God looks at the inside. We look at the outside. God knows the truth about us that many people may never know or we don't want them to know, but God knows about me and what I've done. He knows what I'm going to do. He knows that. So he says that because I know that, there is a need for chapter 8. Chapter 3, he says, in verse 10, it is written, that there is none righteous, no, not one. There's not one person, he says, that was born into this world righteous, except one, and that was the son of Jesus. So he says, because everybody that came into this world was born in sin, was born unrighteous, then somewhere along the way, if things were going to change, there had to be something that could set these people free from that. Chapter 4, he says what? In verse 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Blessed is the man that has experienced the grace of God. Blessed is the man, he says in verse 21, and being fully persuaded that he has promised he was a, what he is a, he promised he is able to perform. If God says he can save you, he can save you. You've got to believe what this book says. Now, this is where the bottom line is. This is what separates every doctrine, every belief, every false cult there is out there. There is one separation unit that exists in the world, and it is the Holy Word of God. That's what makes all the difference in every cult, every belief, every doctrine. Because if the Bible is not true, they could be right. But this is what I tell people that have a conflict with that. I'm going to stick with the good old book. I'm going to stick with the part where God says, Jimmy, you're saved by grace through faith. I'm going to stick with that. Other than I believe that there's a, a guru or a do who or something out there that if I'll go and kneel at his feet or put so much money in his pocket he can pray me up to heaven. I don't believe in that junk. I believe that the Bible says God made me. I was born in sin. God saved me. I'm a child of the king. I have certain priorities in my life because I'm a Christian that a lost person doesn't have and I'm going to be talking about all those things this week. What God blessed me with that lost people never know about. That's what it is. I'm persuaded, he says, that what God's promised, he'll perform. I am persuaded that everything this book says is true. You cannot pick and choose in the Word of God what you want to believe. God doesn't allow that. He said, Paul writing said, I am persuaded. Not just persuaded, but he uses the adjective and he says, I am fully persuaded. And what he's promised, he'll do. And the promise of God is this, Brother Scott. If you'll repent of your sins and only come to him, he said, I'm faithful and just to forsake you of your sin. Folks, I want to tell you something. That happened to me 50 years ago this past April, and I'm fully persuaded what happened that day was real. You need to be fully persuaded that there's a day in your life when you can say, I know it was real. I remember the day, like that song says, that the Lord saved me. He said, I'm fully, so that's chapter 5. Chapter 5, 4. Chapter 5 says this. In verse 8 it says that God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You're getting the gist where he's coming to. All this leads to chapter 8. Where I was. The next word I'll get to, probably not today, but maybe tonight is the word now. That's the next there in that same verse. 
He said, I'm persuaded that what God has said, that he, God loved me, that even while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. One of the most beautiful songs that have ever been written is a song that says that when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. 2,000 years ago when they hung him and they killed him, he didn't do that because he needed to be seen or needed to be shown. He did that because I needed that. He knew I had no hope of heaven whatsoever had it not been for the blood, not the cross so much, but the blood from the old rugged cross. Here's what he said in this scripture here. This is what he said. Chapter 5. God commended his love. Chapter 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Justified by faith. Now, I've said this, and this is something you don't have to agree with me on. This is my own personal opinion. I've used it before. I've said it to you standing here. I've done many funerals, and I've used this term while I was doing funerals. All preachers won't agree with me on this, and, and that's fine. Everybody's got their own opinion. But if you were to ask me today, preacher, what do you think is the greatest word in all this big Bible here? There's a lot of great words in there, aren't there? But for me personally, the greatest word in here is the word faith. Because the Bible says that we're saved by grace through faith. Man, I'm trusting. i never seen God. I've never literally spoke with God. But I'm here to tell you, when God wants to talk to you, He knows how to talk to you. You may say, Preacher, have you ever heard from God? Oh, yes, I have. Brother Tommy... You ever heard from God? He ever talked to you? Yes, sir. Brother Lim, tell you the same thing. Did he come like a voice like mine preaching? No, but I can tell you what. I've had my life turned around, moved in a different direction just because somewhere I, something pulled me and said to me, Jimmy, you got to do this, you got to do that, and it never was a loud voice. But you know what? When I do something wrong, when I do something that ain't in the Bible, I'm going to tell you right now, the second I do that, there's something to me says, Jimmy, you ought not be doing that. Hey. By faith, by faith we're saved through God. The Bible says concerning faith that it is impossible to please God without faith. Think about that. What makes you live a better life and, and what makes you try to walk a better path and what makes you try to be a better Christian is your faith in God and your faith that what this book says is true and that you live by what this book says. We have access in verse 2 of chapter 5. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Hope. Now i got to tell you something. When we look out at a world that we live in today, he uses the term hope. But I'm going to tell you from what I listen to and what I see and what I hear in the world today, people are a long way in this world from ever having hope again. I'm going to tell you that's where the world is. They don't see a bright future. Unless they're a Christian. Folks, I'm here to tell you, this is my true story. I do not get caught up in the fears of this world. I'm not afraid of dying. I'm not afraid of anything that Satan has put at me because I believe in this book, and I believe in what this book says. And God says that I'm going to live as I have hope. He said, weeping may endure for the night, but Jimmy joy is coming in the morning. 
It ain't always going to be this way. And not only is it not always going to be this way, there's a better place of coming that this place down here won't hold a drop in the bucket to Jesus when he comes, sets up his new kingdom, and everything is perfect. You want people, want people there will be no news, need for Fox News. There will be no need for CNN. That stuff won't even be on television if we have television anymore. Because it's all going to be joy. No more sadness. Can you, can, does that not make you want to say, Lord, come quickly. Joy, happiness, all this. Chapter 5, I just read to you what he says. Chapter 6, he says in the last verse that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God through Christ Jesus is eternal life. One of the great preachers of all times, of all times, preached a sermon entitled as one of the most famous sermons that there is today. And it is entitled Payday Someday. That's what that verse of Scripture says right there. That the wages of sin is death. Now let's go back. All this ties together. All this gets to chapter 8. It's been a hard singing and a walking so far. Chapter 8 turns all this around. If the wages of sin is death, why in the world do we live in a world for people that doesn't even cross their mind. They never think that there's going to be a payday someday. They never think that this world is going to keep, not going to keep on going like it's going. They don't ever want to think that there's a day of reckoning coming. And there's a day of reckoning coming for the nations. There's a day of reckoning that's coming for the people who don't know Jesus. We ever had desire in our heart today. I know I got it, and it burns me to see people come to Jesus. It's very hard. I've talked to many preachers in the last couple of weeks. Church is hard now. It is. It's frustrating because people don't seem to care about the wages of sin anymore. They go do what they want to do. Well, there was another time in the world where they'd done the same thing. God says that, that he was not on their mind, which is pretty much what I see in the world today. Chapter 6. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Chapter 7. All right. I've led you there. I'm going to leave you there with this. Tonight, I'm going to take you through it. I just, this has been the prefix for chapter 8. Why did, God, or did Paul put the greatest chapter in the Bible in this particular place? Because of what's written in the first seven chapters. He had to come to it. He had to come with something after what was written. Chapter 7 and verse 20 says this. Now I do what I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. There will be no excuse for sin one day. As a boy growing up, and as a young man, I... I did some things wrong, and, I, and everywhere I go, this is what I tried to do. I tried to get my mom off my back or get my daddy off my back by making some kind of excuse why I did it. And I might got, get by, have gotten by with it sometime because, see, mom and daddy weren't there with me all the time. So I'd make an excuse about this or that or the other. But when I go before my heavenly father, and I have to give account of what I did last week. 
you can't give him a bunch of bull. You can't make an excuse, well, if they hadn't have done this, if, if he hadn't have done that, or somebody hadn't have done the other, I wouldn't have done that. That don't work with God. Why? Because God's been with you everywhere you've been this week. You can't tell him a lie. You may think you can, but he knows you. I know that what I do is the sin that dwelleth in me. So let's go back where we started, chapters 1 and 2, born with a sin nature. Everybody in here sins. We all do. That's why where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Because God knew we was going to need a lot of grace. So he says that in there. And this is the key to the leading of chapter 8 right here. The last two verses. Got to go back where I started. I ain't talked about but one word today. That's therefore. Now I am giving you every reason why chapter 8 was written. Paul says it, therefore, because of what came before. I had to put chapter 8 in here. He said, O wretched man that I am, in verse 24, shall deliver me or free me from the body of this death. And I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. He says, because I was born in sin. Because I may be saved now, but I still have sin. When we get saved, and, 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 and this is what it ought to be, we not to realize that we're not going to live that perfect life. I remember the night, I, 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 go, I ain't got time. I remember everything that happened to me that night I got saved. I remember about what time it was. I remember where it was. I remember who the preacher was. I remember what the sermon was. And I remember what a response the people in the church gave me when I admitted that I needed God to forgive me. I never asked him to do that before. Folks, I can't, you know, my mind is getting a little shaky now. But you know something I can't shake? That. I can't shake that. I can't shake. I don't remember anything about my childhood. Zip. Zero. Nothing. That's just me. But I can remember when I was 25 years old. And I can remember when I said a prayer and asked Jesus to come in my heart. And he forgot. I can remember that. So what chapter 8 is going to be all about is this. What do I have to look forward to after chapters 1 through 7? What is God going to do for me in chapter 8? How is God going to respond to all the things that Paul said in chapter 7? You see, this is it, and I'll close today. Tonight, I'm going to preach on to you on the freedom that you have. There's four kinds of freedom that you have and I have as children of God that maybe we may look, go through this life, and I know I have because as I've studied this, hey, when I study stuff, the person I have to look at the most is me because I know more about me than I know anybody else. And so every time I open this book and I read something to prepare for you, I have to look at me first. And I learned things because I filled in all the gaps in chapter 1 through 7. I've done about all that. I am so thankful that God did not cut it off then. God put chapter 8 in there. And I want to tell you tonight what I've learned that I should have known but I didn't know. And this is it. The benefits of my salvation. The benefits that I have received since 1972 when I got saved. This scripture caused me to look back and see 
four ways tonight. That's what I'm going to preach on, teach on, whatever I decide to do. Preach or teach. I can't, get, I can't usually separate the two. Four things that God did for me as a child of God that brought four kinds of freedom in my life that I never had, never experienced without God. I talk about the reason for your receiving your freedom, the result of your freedom, all of these things. I learned a lot that helped me grow a lot in this study. So we're going to have our hymn of invitation now. We're going to close. Tonight I'll be back right there. All of this this morning was nothing but the introduction for the night. And for the rest of the week, starting back again. I give a night off tomorrow night, but Tuesday I'll be at it full frog on chapter 8. I want to ask you today this. We've all got more benefits in God than we ever recognized that we had. I'm going to be honest with you there. We've probably all been blessed by God more than we give him credit for. Sometimes we think we've been blessed because of what we've done. Now we did what we did because God blessed us to be able to do what we did. Every good and perfect gift that you ever had in your life as a child of God came from him. And I'm so thankful of that today. So this morning, just two things. In that scripture in the first seven chapters, it said this. All has sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means everybody from me all the way to the back door, we've messed up. But God knows that. We've also learned that we're not condemned. Hey, don't ever, that's one of the key words in this eighth chapter is the word condemn. I ain't even got to it yet. I ain't did but one word. Therefore. Seven chapters were therefore. But one of the greatest words in there and in the Bible is the word condemn. Condemn's a bad word, isn't it? But he says because of the blood of the cross that we're no longer condemned. We're saved. We've received the greatest blessing. What's the gr- if I'd ask you, what, what do you think is the greatest blessing you could ever receive in life? Well, if I, I put a, uh, a board out there in the parking lot and just let anybody in the community or anybody in the church come by and, I, and I'd have on there, name your greatest blessing. What do you think people would put there? i tell you what they'd put. My children. My wife, my husband, my house, my car, my money. I guarantee you, if you let the community, that's what, that's what it'd be. And then every once in a while, you'd see on that blackboard, my salvation. So you, I hope this week, This is the deal. That salvation will become more real to you and become more important to you and how you live. Because if you're saved, if if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus and you have to be to go to heaven, that day he saved you is the greatest thing ever happened to you. You will not realize it until later on. It's better than anything this world ever gave you right here. Because anything this world gives you will be cut off one day. But God, eternal. I'll take my chances with him. So if you're not sure, because I struggled with this for a long time, about having surety. Romans 8 is about having surety of where you stand with God. And you're not sure. 
You see, I won't get too far ahead in my message. Now, one of the freedoms that you get by being a Christian, and I'll tell you how, is a freedom from doubting your salvation. I've come across a lot of people that doubted whether they were saved or not. Didn't know for sure, or old Satan would come and kick them in the teeth, and, they, and he would bring doubt into their life about what they say. Uh-uh. Romans 8 won't let you do that. So, first thing is, have you ever had that real experience? Do you, do you feel like your heart's been changed? And do you feel like you're a child of the kingdom, and you got a lot of hope, and you ain't worried about heaven, and you ain't worried about hell, and you ain't worried about dying, you ain't worried about those stuff, God's got all that? That's just part of the benefit package of being a child of God. But if you're not sure, be sure. Be sure. Preacher, I won't do that. I won't know that I'm going to heaven. One thing necessary. Repentance. Unless a man or woman repent, they'll never enter the kingdom of God. That's what God says. Well, preacher, tell me about repentance. Repentance is simply this. This is what I did 50 years ago. Lord, I come to you, you know I'm a sinner. Will you forgive me my sins? Save me and become my Lord. That's all I did. That's it. Preacher, it had to be more than that. No, it wasn't. There was no more than that. But look where God took me from and where God brought me to. That's it. Or you may be here today and you may say, Preacher, I don't know that I felt everything God's had in store for me, but I want to. God, I want to have a life filled with joy and I want to have a life that's filled with hope and I'm not worried where I don't worry about this or that or the other. I, Lord, that's what I want. You can have it. Just come to Him and say, Lord, fill me with your Spirit today. Because see, when you get filled with the Spirit of God, you ain't got time for all this other mess. He takes up the slack in there. So as we have our hymn of invitation, Lisa, we, hymn number 301, it, listen, if you would come and, and say, Lord, here I am, you know, I don't understand all the preachers talked about, but this is what I understand. I want to go to heaven. That's what I want to do. I want to get closer to him. I've been, the old devil's been attacking me, and I want to put him off. Whatever God leads you to do as we have our hymn of invitation, would you stand with us, please? God speaking to you. God's touching your heart. You may not know what it is. You just come. The preacher God's talking. forget that we'll be here tonight six o'clock and I'll be jumping in to second <laughs> third word in the first verse I'll be talking about it tonight so you come and, and be with us and we might get a couple more words in for us over with as we learn about who we are in Jesus what are the benefits of Jesus
what a blessing that we've had, I think. You come be with us tonight. Six o'clock. No supper tonight. But Tuesday night, I'll be doing Bible school. I'll be the only one doing Bible school tonight. Be me. But I'll be doing it. Taking off where I left off this morning. Then Tuesday night, five o'clock. Supper. Six thirty. Adult teaching and our kids will be in their classroom. All right. Thank you, Brother Eddie. Newman. Brother Eddie, would you dismiss us in prayer?